big thank you to our worship team, that's uh, Heidi and Calvin and Amanda McNeil, and uh, joined by Laz Stoltz on guitar and Dave Pike on drums. I'd uh, also like to express appreciation to the tech team today, Lynn Smith on uh, streaming, and uh, uh, Wes Beacom's on sound, joined by Owen, his son, on slides, so appreciate the teamwork everybody puts together. And uh, not to forget Laura, who puts the song lyrics together each week as well, a very important part. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that uh, you are our Savior. Thank you that our soul can sing of your beauty even when our mouths can't or are somewhat restricted. Uh, Lord, uh, hear the, the devotion of our hearts and open our minds as well, we pray, to understand your will and to uh, be obedient to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, one other thing I forgot to mention, if you've got young children and don't need to stretch the projector and sound system downstairs are on, so if you want to pop downstairs and uh, walk around a little bit, you're welcome to do that as well. Well, can you recall our church's vision statement? <laughs> Loving Jesus, serving others together. Let's say it together. Loving Jesus, serving others together. An organization needs to be clear on what its mission or vision is in order to move forward together. As we head into our elections meeting this Thursday, our gospel reading helps us look afresh at our mission, our vision, what we're about, what Jesus wants us to be about. As we look at today's passage, there are three main categories. The motivation for the proclamation, the why, the message of the proclamation, that's the what, and the mockery of the proclamation. That's a caution about the who, that not everyone will welcome it. First, um, what ought to be motivating the church to be evangelistic? After all, it's right there in our name, in our denomination's name, Evangelical Missionary Church. In our reading, we see a couple of motivators for the 12 disciples to share the gospel, the evangel, the good news. A couple of the motivators are the misery of those around and the magnitude of what's at stake. First, the misery of the masses. What motivated Jesus, anyway? Matthew 9.36 says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The Greek word behind compassion reflects being moved as if to one's bowels. We might say gut-wrenching. What was it about the crowds that struck the master? They were harassed, it says, or troubled, and helpless or thrown down like defenseless sheep. About a week ago, Patty and I traveled to Owen Sound to get a, a male sheep to be a mate to Cali, our female calico sheep. His name is Rambo. Creative, huh? He seemed to adapt pretty well to being in the pen with the other sheep and goats, but then there was the first day I took him out to the pasture with the others after taking our four-year-old horse, Jade, out first. Yes, Rambo had been in the pen right next to Jade, so probably had some idea that there was this big creature on the other side of the wall. But when Rambo got out to the pasture and looked up and saw this huge, powerful animal a few yards away, Rambo couldn't take his eyes off Jade. He was mesmerized. He just stood there and looked. You're leaving me out here without any protection right next to that? And he just kind of stood there, big-eyed, stared, probably feeling a bit like a very small, helpless sheep. 21st century culture is the most technologically connected one yet with all our networks and devices, but it is simultaneously perhaps the most disconnected one yet. After supper, young people uh, retreat to their rooms on their individual devices. We walk down the street tethered to our phones, not bothering to greet the person passing us. And now COVID has accentuated the isolation and aloneness much more. Seniors stay home to protect themselves, being deemed in a more vulnerable category. We daresn't hug or shake hands, so touch is minimized. 
Masks make it seem we're hiding our face and stop us from communicating a smile. Businesses are struggling, franchises closing. Some folks have to resort to EI or look for new jobs. It's a challenging time. The Center for Addiction and Mental Health, CAMH, is Canada's largest mental health teaching hospital, one of the world's leading research centers in its field. Between May and September this year, CAMH sur surveyed 1,000 Canadians to understand the mental health and substance abuse impacts of COVID-19 and to track changes as the pandemic unfolds. You can see in the graphic here, 21.1% experienced moderate to severe anxiety, up from 19.2% in the previous period. 25.5% engaged in binge drinking. That's a quarter. 20.1% reported they felt lonely. And 21.2% said they felt depressed, up from 18.7%. Yes, the sheep feel harassed and helpless, troubled, and downcast? Are we moved about their state as Jesus was affected down in his innards? Another motivating factor to be proclaiming good news is the magnitude of what's at stake. See 10 verse 14 and 15. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the Day of Judgment than for that town. In case you've forgotten, when Lot escaped with his daughters from those two cities overrun by pride and immorality in Genesis 19, the Lord rained down burning sulfur on the cities. Abraham, from a distance, viewed the destruction, Genesis 19:28. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. Yet Jesus is saying those who reject the words of his messengers will be worse off than Sodom and Gomorrah. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, explained that when Jesus comes, it will be like a thief in the night. Some will suffer wrath, 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, verse 3 there says, While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Destruction and eternal condemnation are a very real possibility for some we know. What if what you have to share about Jesus could spare them that? Do we really believe it? Or have we bought into pluralism's lie that all roads lead up the same mountain? Even the other major religions of the world don't believe that. They make exclusivistic claims. If that were true, the cross would be just one more option instead of absolutely necessary, is what Jesus said. It was. Next, the message. So there's a bit about the motivation for evangelism, the why. That's the misery of the masses, the magnitude of what's at stake. Next, let's look at the message of proclamation. What's Jesus actually presenting? And what should we be presenting to a lost world? I see in this passage two principal things, his mastery and from me to membership. First, his mastery. Verses 37 on Jesus' image for lost people changes from sheep to a harvest field. Have you noticed how much corn has come off already? The harvesters have been busy in Huron County. Matthew 9, 37. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. It's an abundant harvest, apparently. It just needs to be gathered in, lest it go to waste. But note here, there is a Lord of the harvest. God's in control. He's not wringing his hands, fretting about the outcome or which side's going to win. You need to be asking him to provide laborers to gather in the harvest. Also note the specifics of what Jesus is proclaiming in his preaching. Matthew 10, 6 to 8. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. 
The Greek word for preach here means to announce a proclamation the way a herald might call out an official announcement in the town square or announce the arrival of a royal party. Proclaim what? The kingdom of heaven is near, at hand, right nearby. In fact, after Jesus' death and resurrection, it would be present in effect. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The king had been enthroned. Do we really act in our Christian life as if Jesus is truly our king, our master? Is he actually in control or are we trying to call all the shots? The fundamental com confession of a Christ follower is that Jesus is Lord. Romans 10, 9. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the solid promise in God's word. Are we accepting that, believing into it, acting like it's true? Is our message actually meaningful to those around? To those who haven't grown up in the church. Does it sound like we're talking jargon or gibberish? Phrases like, are you saved? Or Christ is Lord may sound canned and not be all that meaningful to the iPhone generation. I was listening to a Kerry Newhoff leadership podcast in which he was interviewing Gordon MacDonald, a leading pastor and author of one, and one-time head of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Gordon MacDonald is now 81 years old, so provides some good perspective. But he said something that challenges rote evangelical thinking. Gordon MacDonald said, I think this period of time is going to change our theology. And just as has happened in Luther's day, in St. Francis' day, in Patrick's day, in Wesley's day, we're going to come out of this with a new way of saying the gospel. Billy Graham's way of saying the gospel doesn't work anymore. Bill Bright's doesn't work anymore, so get ready for something new, end quote. What's that, you say? Billy Graham's and Bill Bright's way of saying the gospel doesn't work? Four spiritual laws is falling on deaf ears? If you don't know about Campus Crusade, which Bill Bright founded, and four spiritual laws, go to four laws, the number four laws dot com, and it's uh, laid out there. Still very good truth, but... Is, is that enough to say these days? It, isn't that the heart of the Christian faith? God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life and so forth? Don't worry, I'm not going to spout heresy here. That method of expressing the good news worked back then, but it needs to be repackaged for a new generation. Kerry Newhoff pressed Gordon MacDonald on this, mentioning Tim Keller had said if he were starting over, he would frame everything around identity. MacDonald responded, I'm editing a bit here, we were talking about the value of the story of the gospel and I, for one, have always been a storyteller and think everybody else should be. But the gospel transits across cultural lines through story form. Keller's comment about identity is probably right. For me, MacDonald says, the key word would be community. But the Christian journey is not a journey alone. It's a journey in fellowship we lead. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Those last two or three words have been ignored by evangelicals for many, many years because we put our emphasis on the individual coming to Jesus. But if you read history, people came to Jesus in groups in those first years. A family came to Christ. A tribe or a village came to Christ. Much of Christianity has lived in concert with other people. So we put too much of an individual emphasis upon it. So, and a quote from Gordon MacDonald. Well, that's one person's response. How would you reframe the gospel in a form your friends might hear better? Is what we're sharing truly good news in that it addresses the issues and concerns modern and postmodern people have? Has our canned gospel been kind of Gnostic? Addressing the, the spiritual side of life, but not having much to do with everyday life. Common people's problems and concerns, such as the environment, abuse, divisions in society. Is there a repackaging we can do which will both keep the essence of the biblical message, but tell it in a way that hits on some of these other issues? 
Look again at verses 7 to 8 in Matthew 10. Jesus said, As you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Jesus apparently isn't sending the twelve out with simply a, a verbal message. It's more than just words. Healing sick people. Probably laying on hands and touch things as, Je as Je Jesus tended to do. Raising the dead, cleansing lepers, the very hardest cases to cure back then. Driving out demons, sometimes actual exorcisms are needed. Sometimes people with mental illness or those who are stressed out benefit from Christian counseling, genuine friendship, the community of going out for coffee, becoming a regular part of a small group where other group members call them up from time to time and see how they're doing. The gospel is not just for our relationship with God. It's salt for society, light for our relationships. The two greatest commands, love God totally and love your neighbor as yourself, bind together the vertical and horizontal dimensions in life. Heal the sick. A lot of Western medicine, unfortunately, involves going to the doctor's office, running some tests, and getting a prescription for some pills without much attention to diet or other lifestyle and relationship issues that may be part of the problem. Is Jesus suggesting a more holistic approach? Does receiving him come with implications for other lifestyle decisions that can impact our health? For example, if we're addicted to comfort food due to low self-worth or behave compulsively in response to past traumas over which we had no control. Matthew 10, 12 to 13 is very intriguing in this regard. He said, as you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. Let your peace rest on it. Let it return to you. What's Jesus talking about here? The Greek word would be reflecting the Hebrew word shalom, which is much broader than just peace in the sense of absence of conflict between two opposing parties. Shalom is more holistic, touching many dimensions of a person's life. John MacArthur describes it as prosperity, well-being, or blessing. Are you experiencing shalom and wholeness in your private life? your thought life, your family relationships? Are you feeling accepted and valued in your community? Do you have a hope and a future? If not, how might the good news of Jesus enter in and adjust the control settings, take out the garbage of past failures and resentments, fill you with the Holy Spirit so you're assured of God's love and direction, empower you to take steps of reconciliation, apology, Settling unfinished business in a positive way. What's the kingdom of heaven translate into in each dimension when you get off the throne and let God be in control? The proclamation of Jesus is about his mastery. It's also about a new membership, broadening us from me focus to realize we're members of a much larger body, the body of Christ. As we let Jesus be in the driver's seat, others will notice and begin to either support you in your new walk or resist you, even oppose you. There's a sorting out that's going to happen, including possible alienation by family members. But followers of Jesus become aware of God's Spirit, joining them together in Jesus' name. Verse 20. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. That's a new birth. A new connectedness to God himself through the Holy Spirit, bringing love and joy and peace and so on into our lives, independent of what's going on around us. Matthew 10, 40 also alludes to this new membership. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. That is, you receive God the Father when you receive Jesus, which the disciples experienced when the Spirit was poured out upon them at Pentecost in Acts 2. There's new membership, the new sense of belonging. One of my favorite verses to put on a membership certificate when somebody joins the church is Matthew 10, 32, where Jesus says, Whoever acknowledges me before men, 
I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Jesus will say, she's mine, or this one belongs to me. He will claim you, own you, acknowledge you before God most high. So, how are you going to repackage your proclamation? How can you retell the good news about Jesus without resorting to canned jargon that would leave a seeker blinking in non-comprehension? Are you prepared to walk with them through a process rather than just sharing a tract with them one time and then never seeing them again? Where's the relational side to your evangelism? As the saying goes, People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Duffy Robbins notes, It takes two things to catch fish, bait and patience. Whether we like it or not, fishing for people will always involve both, and it may occasionally require an all-nighter or two. That's the evangelistic task. On the other hand, no fisherman in his right mind continues to catch fish without giving some thought to how he will preserve them and keep them fresh. Otherwise, at the end of the day, all he has to show for his labor is a big boat filled with smelly, dead fish. End quote. Next section, the mockery of the proclamation. Jesus warns his followers that it's not going to be smooth sailing once they align their lives with his kingdom. Verses 16, 17, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. It goes on to say they'd be brought before governors and kings, verse 18. They'd be arrested, verse 19. There'll be a a sorting out, a sifting of nuggets versus sand. Their membership in Jesus will cause others to walk away from them, even oppose them. Verses 21 to 23. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Families divided, parents handing over their children, having to flee, having all men hate you on account of Jesus' name. Are we really that committed? The cost of discipleship is high. It cuts even closer than natural family bonds. Verses 38 on, Jesus introduces a new concept, the cross, which his listeners must have viewed as an instrument of violent, traumatic death reserved for the worst criminals. Matthew 10, 38. Anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Finding life. But we find it in losing ourselves for him. Being drawn into his expansive and challenging and marvelous kingdom. His mission is our mission. The challenge Jesus calls the 12 disciples to is still ours today in some respects. How do we speak it afresh in a divided COVID-threatened, fragmented 21st century world? How do we announce the peace, the shalom Jesus brings in a way others will hear? Here's an example from Time magazine about one brave person courageously pursuing their mission. Everyone in Cabrini Green, one of Chicago's toughest housing projects, it seems, knows 63-year-old brother Bill. He's hard to miss. He wears a flowing sky-blue cassock made from hundreds of tattered denim patches. And the picture is not Brother Bill, but somebody is carrying on what he started. This is Brother Jim and uh, some others that assist in the ministry there. Uh, But Brother Bill's mission is to bring peace to the troubled housing project. Fifty-three times by his count, he has waded into gunfire in order to stop it. Fifty-three times the gunfire has stopped, and fifty-three times he has emerged unscathed. He talks trigger-itching assailants into putting away their guns and going home to their families. He sits beside wounded gangsters who hope to die and persuades them to live. And he insists that there is nothing special about him or his accomplishments. He just says, I'm an ordinary man on an extraordinary mission. He doesn't preach. He loves. 
One of his fans, a 22-year-old vice lord, says, I really think God sent him here. Wow. An ordinary man on an extraordinary mission. You'd have to be super committed to have to your mission in order to wade into gunfire. Not just once or twice, but 53 times. I wonder if it gets any easier each time. Probably not. I don't think I even want to find out. But there are some parallels between what Brother Bill does and what Jesus called the 12 to do on their first mission excursion. Brother Bill brings about peace. He also risks his all, puts his life on the line. And Brother Bill helps people find new reason to live. You may be thinking, well, I'm glad that's his mission, not mine. Yet, Faith in the God who does the impossible draws us to discover how the Lord would use each of us to reach others with our unique and very personal gifts. It may be scary to step out and share about Jesus. If it weren't scary, it probably wouldn't require faith, totally depending on God. May the peace of Jesus come to a house near you as we continue as a congregation to discern together how the Lord is calling us to proclaim his mastery and shalom right here where we live. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that in Jesus your kingdom has come amongst us, challenged us, convicted, and converted us. Help us proclaim better and with more conviction his peace to our friends and neighbors who are like those harassed and helpless sheep in need of a shepherd. Show us our part in gathering in this great harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, today we're going to honor somebody who's been working in our midst in the harvest. Uh, Pastor Rob is retiring, effective November 1st, and uh, well, we, Rob, do you and Ange want to come up? And uh, if your kids, it's up to you whether you want to join them. Come on up to the front. Jason Butter from the Elders is coming up, and we have a brief presentation for you. We also have a video. People have sent in some uh, things they appreciate about Rob's ministry, and so we'll, we'll play that. While it's playing, if there's anybody else that would like to say a few words briefly about what you appreciate about Rob, you'd be welcome to do so. But uh, We'll play the video now, and then please. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. All right, Rob and Ange, uh, Time that you have moved on, so just as you move on into your next chapter of life, things that come to mind from First Thessalonians 5. All right, Rob and Ange, uh, it's time that you have moved on, so just as you move on into your next chapter of life, things that come to mind from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18, always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, and we pray and wish you well on your new journey and your new adventure. Besides being the warm, welcoming, approachable couple that Pastor Rob and Ange are, there are many things we appreciate about them. Thank you for the long hours spent in learning and administrating plan to protect creating a safe environment for all of us. We appreciate your willingness to serve and getting information whenever we needed it. So from VBS, church get-togethers at your home, Sunday school picnics, Sunday school programs, many enjoyable hours were spent serving together. Thank you. Hey Rob and Ange, you can probably tell by the background exactly where I am and I know you guys would appreciate it so that's part of the reason why I'm making the video where I am. Anyways, just wanted to say a quick thank you from both Melody and I for the way that you've spoken into all three of our kids lives over the years. It's been amazing to watch you guys work with the youth of both our church and the community at large and our prayer for you is that as you go forward God will continue to direct your paths so clearly and that he will continue to bless your work no matter what you do. God bless, guys. Yeah. Hi, Uncle Robin and Ange. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, bring grace to you, and give you peace. I love you, and so does Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Rob, for the many times you came to my rescue to clear up computer glitches at the desk monitoring job. You're always so patient and helpful. Also, great to see the passion you and Ange have for mentoring our youth. I appreciate Rob for his incredible leadership in the children's youth and family ministry. He's an example of a true man of God. To Uncle Rob and Annie Hand, we made an acrostic poem for you. The C in Campbell stands for courageous. A stands for amazing. M stands for my aunt and uncle. P stands for people, person. B stands for believer in Jesus. E stands for enjoyable to be around. L stands for lovable. L, the other L stands for laughs a lot. We love you from from Briella and Naomi. Naomi. My Naomi. Here's some things I have appreciated about Pastor Rob's ministry here at Huron Chapel. His passion for young people, pouring himself into teaching them, joining in sports with them, counseling them at the school, and also one-on-one. -on -one. His gentle, sensitive, good-natured personality, his readiness to laugh and see the fun in something. His solid work ethic, being reliable to put in adequate time on the job, and including some evenings and weekends, while always trying to balance this with being a good husband and father is being a pro on everything related to Plan to Protect, and is being a real asset to have as part of our staff team, always pulling his weight, having practical experience and wisdom to share. And uh, I'd just like to send him off with a prayer adapted from Romans 16.25. May the Lord establish you by the gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. Hi, Uncle Robert, Annie, and may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. I love you, and so does Jesus. Amen. Bye-bye. Others who uh, contributed. Um are there anybody else that would like to share a few words just appreciating Pastor Rob? I know it requires getting up on camera, which is can be a little bit scary, but uh, if here's a good chance to. <laughs> if you didn't catch that, it was exemplary. Thank you, Dave. Uh, very true. Uh, you obviously love Jesus and want to feed his sheep. Thank you for all your hours. I often thought of you at Pitch and Praise and we weekends and evenings and and for all your snacks. <laughs> community, real pillars that we can look to and uh, just thank the Lord for their, for their uh, impression that they're, they have on the young people and the youth, the, the hearts that you have to, to lead and to serve. You're a, a real good witness for this place and for this area and we thank you for it. If you uh, didn't get a chance, uh, please feel free to talk to them personally after. Uh, they'd sure appreciate to hear it anyway, uh, whether now or then. 
And uh, come on up, uh, Rob and Ange, and uh, Jason, uh, on behalf of the elders, has a, a couple of things to say. And, uh, well, on behalf of the elders, I just want to thank you guys for your years of service and how you have worked together as a team and shown us what being a team means together. Um, it's a it's a great loss to have you stepping off of staff, but it's a great benefit to us to know you're still going to be here, to be around, to be with the youth, to still be working together in community with all of us. And uh, everything that was said in the video, I would just like to give a big amen to that it has been wonderful to have you guys here. And uh, as you move forward into your next into your job that you started that also is ministry it's not just not just because you're not in the church doesn't mean you're not involved in ministry so um you still have that wherever you go and uh as not everyone knows uh rob's work computer that he's had here for the last couple of years or longer probably he's gonna we're as elders are giving that to him to keep as a small token of what he, as a gift, I guess, kind of. And we just I just want to thank you both so much for what you've done. Can I talk for a couple? <laughs> One good thing, by getting this computer, we don't have to delete the thing. The plan to protect is all on there still, so there we go. <laughs> uh, I've been reflecting this week on a passage that I preached on on Thanksgiving. Uh, it, was a, it was a good reflection for me. First of all, we've been a team here for years, 13 to be exact, right? I've been here for 13 and longer than that. Um, yeah, so it's, been, it's because of all of you that this has been such a sweet little ride. Um, as you reflect, though, as a leader, there are times that you need to say, it's really not about the person who's the leader, it's about the community as a whole. And so sometimes, as the leader, you need to just take a step and say, no, I need to back up and let people, the congregation, move forward together and not make it about a leader thing, make it about a church thing, a congregation thing. Let's move forward together. That's how it's supposed to be. The other beauty of this is, like Jason said, I, I have moved into another job. And uh, it's in the world. And it's different. And it is, it's good. Like, it's a good spot to be. And, uh, yeah. Angie and I are still doing discipleship ministry. I started my group this week. And Chester is going, and it's been going for a long time. Yeah. So, yeah, we're still doing ministry, and we love it. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you. For those at home that can't see, the congregation are standing. Uh, thank you. You may be seated. 